get them to think, this is exciting material, and we have a lot of people who manage to make it dull. Now, <laughs> not that, it, that should be the, the we should get that together or not. So let's start with, with uh, a classic example. I almost always, I've done this the first uh, statistics class the last couple of years in several settings, and it's worked out very well. And the first one, uh, first example we'll do, involves taking polls rates of people in the class. Now, okay, we have a nice small group, but we'll do a little sampling anyway. So, if I were to just take a moment to so interact with learning, include the class, and find your poll either on your wrist or on your neck, wherever you're good at finding it. And I'll, I'll count for uh, 30 seconds here, and then we'll, we'll double roll it to get your heart rate and beats per minute. So, hope you all have it, and start counting now. Anyway, 
All right, so what we see, here's my, my, uh, my message to my students here is that pulse rates are variable. Uh, we, we see that not everybody has the same pulse. People's pulses vary. So what are the factors that account for variation in pulses? Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 this nice purple one. So the point I want to make to my students is that pulses are a variable. Varies by person. So, what are the, some of the factors that cause pulse to vary? Why might one person's pulse be different than another? Weight. Weight. Age. Gender. Gender. We didn't have any women in our sample today, but in class that's usually not too hard. Uh, Physical condition. Caffeine. Caffeine. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, but I drink a lot of tea. I uh, do that. Physical condition. Okay. Stress level. Stress level. Right. Now, one of the things I like to do, uh, I won't take all the time to do in class to do this, but one of the things I like to do is when I come back to my students later and talk about the idea of the differences between categorical and quantitative variables and say, how are you going to measure these things? And discrete versus continuous. What what measures do we use on these variables? I actually, I come back and use this example quite often the first week. Stress level is another good one. Medication. Uh, medication, sure. The, which, you know, again, it's fun to think about how you would measure these things. It's not hard to, to make a list. Let's see. Uh, oh, I don't have smoking on here. Yeah, I get to contribute one myself. Uh, other favorites. Measurement error, yeah, right. That's where you keep me off. So in a room full of statisticians, you're much more likely to get this answer. But going back, <laughs> going, going back to slide one, what students never say the first day of this class is they never put in this part of the model. Nobody ever says pulses <laughs> are, uh, are in some sense random. There's some measurement error, I had to double. Plus, again, we won't take the time to do this today. What I do in class usually is I have the students take their pulse again. And I ask the same people in the sample, what's your pulse now? And they'll tell me, and I'll say, well, you know, if Frank's pulse changed from 64 to, to 60, I'd say, you know, maybe the course is put in the swing. Go, now what's what? He's about the same weight, he's about the same age, <laughs> he's still the same gender. None of these things have changed very much. Uh, so, so another factor would be the time. Sure, you could think of it uh, being a random variable with time, something that, that varies over time. But there's a random component. What I want students to learn is, what I want students to understand in the first day is, if I told you all these, uh, all this information about a person, here's my 163-pound, 38-year-old male, non-caffeine drinking, healthy, marathon running, uh, but uh, has an ill parent uh, and is taking medication uh, uh, to help recover from some minor surgery and is not a smoker. What's his pulse? You don't know. You know, there's no, you can't say y equals f of x here. Even if you have a lot of x, you can't say y equals f of x1 of x n. There's a piece you just can't account for. And there's a lot of, uh, and what we measure, what engineers are going to measure in their career, when computer scientists do internet time, another one would, I use this idea later in the semester when students are doing their projects, and I'd like to have them think about the same thing. What are the sources of error you might account for? That's really just where you look at your project. And how much random error is there? That's what I want you to learn. So students will say something like, I think the amount of time it takes for me to load an internet site will depend on time of day and the amount, because that's a good proxy for amount of internet traffic. Well, that's great, but it won't be the same at 11 o'clock today as it is 11 o'clock tomorrow. There's still there's other things that you don't want. And I like the philosophical part about this. So what I usually do is, is have students retake their polls here. And then the model I want them to be thinking about is, Pulse equals some function of all these factors plus some error. And that, and that error is the beginning of the idea of, of randomness. And the philosophy of when you know you might think of randomness as just being things we don't understand yet. Maybe when our our uh, understanding of the universe becomes perfect. It won't be <laughs> you know, we won't have randomness, but we seem ways away from that. Uh, and students generally sort of enjoyed that, especially they seem to enjoy taking the pulses. I also had them write it down and pass it in, and my TAs take it in, and then I have a data set to work with, and 
course of the, the weeks. I, I, I try not to beat it to death through the whole semester, but that seems uh, a good way to start. So that's one of the activities that, that I just love to do the first day. But I noticed with the engineers that, that the idea didn't really seem to take in it. The, I, I gave them the first homework and the first quiz, gave opportunities to say, can you think of other reasons why these numbers might be variable? And nobody wrote down random, or hardly anybody out of 200 wrote down uh, randomness. So I decided I needed some more of these. And so I'll, I'll, uh, Oh yeah, that'd be great. Uh, you can, can pass those around. And so here's a few more activities. So it's what, one we just did now, I have numbered activity two, because I had a lot of repeat customers from last year. So I'm gonna skip it. Uh, and yeah. what we'll do now is take a look at activity one, when you uh, open that one up which is a little bit of a goal that gets students to realize some real world problems have a random component. And another way of saying that is some puzzles don't have an easy solution. One thing students do the most, I've talked with a couple of my students who are interested in education this past year, and they kept bringing me puzzles. They, they knew I liked puzzles. They kept bringing me in puzzles. And many of the puzzles they had in Games Magazine and places they'd find them on the internet were what comes next in this sequence? That's very, very deterministic thinking that the engineers especially really like. And it's something we're all trained to do, especially mathematically. What comes next in this sequence? So I came up with this idea, if you look at uh, the first uh, interior page in your handout where it says recognizing randomness, I came up with a few sequences and said, what number comes next in this sequence? So why don't you take a minute now uh, and look those over. By the way, something I'm going to say later, but I'm reminding myself now because I'm terrible at it. If you're going to use in-class techniques like this one, one of the things it takes is patience. And if, if there's a uh, if there's a suit I'm weak in as a teacher, it's hoovering or a drop. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to give a couple minutes for you to do this, even though the science just killed me. <laughs> If you have any questions about it, let me know.
one of the things I, I would like to do is to get my students thinking along the lines of, I really try to randomize whenever I can. You know, I randomize which EA is great, which homework assignments the first week. And I, I try to randomize, get used to the idea that randomization is, is kind of a fair technique. So I made up these five sets of numbers for various processes, but I did randomize the order in which they appear. Um, and one of the things, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do this well. And this is based on some, I, I've done this before at St. Michael's. I haven't tried it in the big class at Coin Allen. This was originally Robin Black's idea, uh, which is I'm going to collect, I'm going to assign homework every class this fall and only collect it once in a while. I'm going to randomly decide before I go to class. I'm going to collect homework a third of the time. I'm going to roll a die and collect on one or two uh, before I leave my office. But I'm not going to tell the students what that process is. At the end of the semester, I'm going to ask an um, uh, assignment. I will collect. I'll make sure I collect. What process did I use to decide how to collect the homework? And you know, a lot of them are going to have a reason here. You collect on Tuesday or Tuesday, but less than 80% of the class came. Every time I've tried this, and Robin's tried it, you teach statistics for a semester, you talk about how much you like randomization, say, how did I decide to collect the homework? And you'll still have a lot of people who think they see a pattern. You know, that uh, I mean, I, you collected on Tuesdays of the previous weekend, you went out of town. You know, they have, they have lots of ideas about what you want to do this. So let's think about um, these list of numbers. Which ones are uh, are uh, what we might have for the next? Whether we discern a pattern here. Uh, how about the first set? Um, then I can figure out that the next one would be smaller than what you said. Okay. Three okay. negatives, three positive, two negatives, one positive. They have one negative, so that would be smaller. Okay. So what you see is a. Uh, a pattern of uh, increase, decrease. Yes. Okay. Other guesses about the next number or the uh, or the pattern? Anybody, anybody want to hazard a guess at that one? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I took lit, uh, took to heart your notion of give a range of values. Okay. So I said it's going to be someplace between ten and hundred. Is so, it 10 and 100 or 10 and 99? Um, well, okay. <laughs> you can convince me to 99. Right, okay. Because they, they, they do appear to be two digit numbers. So right. you, you want to give a range. Okay, that's an interesting logic. Anybody have a single number that they, there's no penalty here if you say <laughs> took 72 because I made 72. But the, it's, it, very, very often the student thinking on these problems is very, very much looking for that increasing, decreasing. The students will be looking for an odd even pattern, you know, multiples of three, sort of. You know, the, 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 that's exactly the kind of the pattern I want. Okay, I'll go over what they all were in a second. Anybody else want to hazard a guess on that one? How about the next one? How about set B? Twice the last number plus the sum of the prior numbers plus one. Ooh, twice the last number plus the sum of the prior numbers plus one. That's a different action number. Yeah, they are the ultimate number matching number. So a lot of people could uh, could get that. So B really is. There. Did, you, did you bother to figure out what the next one was? No, F16. It's uh, 2584. Uh, if you actually, if you try that formula, the next number would be 2584. But they come in ratios and that's made 2566. Ah, uh, but ratio 2566. Great. Right? Uh, ratio 2.6. Uh -huh. Yeah, because. Uh, that 2.6 is actually, you know, the, the golden ratio. One, six, one, plus, six, one plus root five over two squared is 2.6. So, you know, it's, it's the first time it's 1.6, blah, blah, blah. So 1.628, and the second time it's squared. 1.618 squared is 2.618. So, uh, cool. All right, so that's good. Uh, so some people got that one. And again, what, what I'm asking with my students is to think of uh, are these models deterministic or are they random? How about C? Notice I didn't leave a lot of room for stress. Right, C. Right. Yeah, so C looks like probably a good guess for the next number would be 22. If you, you know, and again, I tell my students, you know, I could make these tricky. I could be a jerk about it and say, no, the next one matters. But you know, the idea here is that in the real world, a lot of times what you're trying to do is predict things from data, especially engineers. They do a lot of. I teach the time series graduate course as well, and so I like to get people. To, a lot of them I know are going to be taking that down the line and thinking about prediction. And so I like to, to get them to be thinking about sort of what the what's the underlying process. How about in, in D? What do you see there? Anybody want to hazard a guess or a range? 
I guess of 25? Uh, none of them vary by more than uh, four. Okay. So the only difference is you get two, four, three, two, four, three, two, yeah. two, three. Uh, take uh, negative three. It's like a right, yeah, negative three. Right. Oh. Okay. Right. So the, the, the variance seems like less than four between steps. So people seem sort of right. people seem to feel together that there's a, well, I don't, I don't want to phrase it for the students, I try to make, make them say it. What, what do you think might be a reasonable range, a reasonable statement about what's going on? Near 23. Near 23. Okay. Near, uh, that, I would like that statement. We're not, we haven't learned to quantify anything about randomness yet, so I think that's a, a very good way to put it. Uh, we'll, we'll learn later on about how to get more specific about statements like that. And how about, uh, how about set E? It's 3, 4, or 5. Okay. So 3 to 5 seems like a good range. Anybody got a particular one they really like? For any reason? No. 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 Four is right. the most frequent. Right. So you, you, could, you could take four as, as sort of the modal occurrence. Yeah, that's good.
very close. So we'll get it within a few places. So I like that because you have a deterministic process, but it's there's several ways to get a good approximation of the answer or to get the answer exactly. In C, just just coincidence in the answer is 22 again, almost everybody picks that up right away. They say this is something we're used to doing and trained to do is we recognize deterministic processes, uh, linear processes, especially linear processes we recognize really well. Uh, the next number in D actually turned out to be 28, which is, you know, near 23, I think. Uh, depending on your application. And basically what that is, is I just did a regression line with the next number is all we did. But each number in the sequence is twice where you are in the sequence, plus six, plus uh, a normal error with uh, mean zero and standard deviation two, and then rounded to the nearest integer. So I actually just generated, used Minitab to generate a list of, of points along, randomly generated around a regression model. And, uh, and again, this is a very important Concept. I really try and emphasize this for the engineers, but I think for all students, it's good to see that real life data is often follows a deterministic component plus a random component. And recognizing, trying to, to what we'll do later in the course, of course, when we do regression, is guess at this. And I like to give them this data back with, uh, I didn't bring that today, I forgot the, the mini tab out over that. Uh, if I was at a high tech session, we could type it in. But, you know, we have a calculator, we'll try that later. If you type in the index, you know, one through ten under these numbers and make your regression line, or it comes out something like one point nine three x or plus uh, five point eight, or you know, you, you get a number near it. You, you do a pretty good approximation of that line, uh, and we get close. Now, the last one I really like to discuss with my students is some of them get fairly mad about this. <laughs> <laughs> the process is it's the par on the end hole at Trumansburg Golf Club near Ithaca, which is one place I play golf. Times a year, and so you know, golf balls are all part three, four, or five typically. And uh, the eleventh hole, I listed the first ten holes. The eleventh hole is part three. And this, uh, I think, this is a really important idea that sometimes you recognize a process. You have underlying knowledge that allows a process that appears random to somebody else to be deterministic to you. And I think. Last year, my students got mad at me when I did this one, and they know this. And I, you know, they, we argued about is this random or not? Well, it depends. If you don't know the underlying process, it appears random. If you know the underlying process, it's you know, you, you, somebody. I, I could show that list to several friends of mine who played golf there, and they would say, "Oh yeah, that's true, it's working." I already know that. <laughs> so you know, I have nerdy, I have nerdy friends. I'm missing, but, uh, this, you know, this could happen. So the recognition of uh, what's you know, one person's randomness, another person's deterministic, it does depend on your level of underlying knowledge. It depends on what variables you know, what factors you understand to put into the model. In a, in a big picture sense, I'd like to come back to that one later on. But it's, it's important. I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Jason about his application today, but I'm sure in a lot of these surveys of customer satisfaction, you need to know what variables to ask for. And if you don't know, you won't, you, there may be a, a, quite a strong underlying process that takes a lot of the randomness away. But if you don't know what to look for, if you don't have a hint, then you wouldn't, wouldn't have that. So I, I really enjoy having this list of mixed values sort of to, to give my students to think about the fact that some of the things they see are going to be deterministic. Well, by the way, what I'm going to do next year is I'm going to switch these because you know a lot of students at Cornell, I'm sure this happens everywhere, but Cornell is especially notorious for you know kids in fraternity say, oh, here's all my notes from last semester. So what I'm going to do this coming semester is, for two-digit values, I actually have the number of games won by the Chicago Bulls over the last 15 years or so. And that actually looks just about like this, because they won as many as 70, and this year, coming straight season, they only won 16 or something. So it looks almost the same. But again, that will sort of take the place of this one, then. It looks random, but if you know the process, uh, and, and you know, I'll go up through last year, and then I'll put in this year. And this one I'm going to change, and I'm going to just randomly generate uh, three. Most golf courses have four part threes, four part fives, and fourteen part uh, ten part fours. So I'm going to random, randomly generate threes and fours and fives at that ratio, and make the last one random now. And so some, I know I'm really looking forward to <laughs> some wise guy saying, "I bet those little bars on the golf course are going to say no, those are random." And, uh, <laughs> always friends going to be. I will have, I'm, uh, anyway, that's the only thing I'm looking forward to about school starting, <laughs> is switching these from semester to semester. Uh, 
um, and uh, sneaking that in there. So those are some of the, that, that's one other activity. It looks like we got about five minutes away from going away to lunch. What I did was I brought a number of activities to do different things in both sessions, and you take the handout away and talk to people who come the other time. But let me just quickly do one that, that's coming up on the end of the sheet that I just tried this past year for the first time. Uh, we'll just do this on the chalkboard. And in a room full of statisticians, this is maybe a, a little tricky, but can I for a volunteer? Right? Come on up, but five points at random in that square. I'll only do five, so it's six on the sheet, but we'll do five. But five points at random in the square. Okay. Now, see, for anyone who's got statistics enough, that <laughs> it's something that I always help my students want to do. What I like to do is come up after that and draw sort of my best tic tac toe board. And if you ask students to do that, you almost never get two points in the same square. In fact, last semester I tried it with eight. Uh, I said put eight points at random in this square and drew the tic tac toe board. Now, it's an interesting geometry problem of could you always, you know, if you were willing to draw it like uh, this and this, could you always get all the points in different squares? Uh, I don't have to think about that. I'm not very good at geometry. I'll have to think about that. It, it just occurred to me on the way up. But students will almost always put, you know, when you ask people who aren't familiar with the idea to generate random points, they tend to put them much too spread out and not nearly enough clump. There are two reasons I really like this problem. One is that, that it demonstrates that, that you can draw this afterwards and say, well, does that appear random or does that appear a pattern? And I found that trying it a few times in the labs, I, I actually walked around from lab to lab with my TAs and tried this one in, in the small groups, um, that with five or six points with students, you can almost always be sure to draw the tic-tac-toe board and get you in different boxes. With eight, you'll often get enough something that, that you really have to draw, you know, quite off center to make it work. But you draw this and then say, well, they're all in different boxes. Is that, uh, is that a, a, a really a random pattern or, or is that random or is that pattern? And you talk about their process for that. Because people aren't very good at recognizing randomness or generating randomness. Two things that we want to emphasize through the semester. The other thing I really like about this, I still teach a little more probability to the engineers. They're going to take a lot of it. If I was teaching Back at St. Michael's, I would teach a course much more like Robin's teaching now, as we talked about in the opening one. And I probably wouldn't, I, I might do this example just for the visual effect, but I wouldn't then do the calculation. But what I really like is when the students come on in different boxes, almost all students have now seen the old classic birthday problem. I mean, I've seen some junior high teacher, when they had a few minutes left in class, or a high school teacher, has gone over the probability that two, two people in a room will have the same birthday. And we still do that one in my class, although many of the students are familiar with it and kind of hold on and they, they see the punchline coming way ahead. The nice thing is, this is the same calculation. Because you can, on the first test, I love them, I like to do this example, talk about it a little bit. We do the birthday problem a different day, and then on the first test, I ask what's the probability that they're, uh, that, you know, all five points are in separate boxes or no two points in the same box. And it's exactly the same calculation, so that they've been paying attention how to do that. This is a little one, a little calculation you can do by hand. It's quite small, it's about, uh, comes out about 0.114. So that's, uh, and if you do it with eight points, then it's really tiny. I mean, it's a uh, very, very small fraction, down about one out of, about one out of 10,000. So the chance that you, you know, put eight points at random in and you won't match is very tiny. So this is really a nice, it's kind of a, a recovery of the old birthday problem in the context students haven't seen at a small scale. And for, at least for the engineers, where they have some calculus and they're trying, we're trying to take advantage a little bit of math problem solving skills. One of the things that we uh, have stressed a little bit is that so often it's easier to compute probability by looking at probability of a complement. And there's no better problem than ones like this to do that. So if you are still teaching some probability, it's a really nice way, either in, in the finite math course or in a statistics course, this is a nice way to sneak up on that. Okay, I'm just going to end with one other example, uh, this idea of tying in, uh, well, let, let me ask first, how many, how many of you teach students who either have or are taking a little calculus at the time when they take your course? Okay, about half. I'll just mention quickly, one parallel I came up with this year is at the end of this one semester course, 
Because we're teaching for engineers, we end with a quick unit on vectorial designs and fractional vectorial designs. And one thing you're interested in then is how big an effect, how big does an effect have to be to be significant? Of course, once you know the kind of cutoff size for what's a significant effect, it's, it's quick to pick, pick one out well, which effects are significant and which aren't. And one of the things I came up with this past year is some of my students were really seem to be having a little trouble with the logic of that. And so I asked them if they remembered in calculus uh, when they were studying series and convergence of series, the comparison test. And they actually, with just a little prodding, were pretty good at remembering you have something bigger than a divergent series that diverges, and you have something smaller than a convergent series that converges. So I was going with the idea that you have something larger than an effect, an effect larger than an effect you know is significant. It's significant. And you have something smaller than an effect you know is not significant. And that sort of parallel in logic between the, the two courses is something I think has been a little wonders. If, if I have a, an idea for something I'd like to think about in the next year, it's, it's you know, bridging that gap back a little bit. We've spent, I feel like we've had 10 or 15 years where we've really thumped in this idea that we have to teach statistics a lot differently when we teach mathematics. And I think we've got that. But I think we also sometimes risk making it seem like statistics is just a bag of tricks. Uh, a little too anecdotal. Uh, and so tying it back in, the, the logic, the reasoning, the modeling we did looks like a lot like the math they've seen in other courses, even if they don't like that. Uh, it, I think it's, it's maybe an idea that, that we can do it a reasonable, I think we can, you know, I think we can, can reach back for a little more, uh, a little better equilibrium. All right, well anyway, I hope, uh, if you go through the handouts and you have questions on the other uh, activities that I wrote up, uh, let me know. And I have my hand out from last year, which has four or five others. Uh, and if, if you try any of these and would like to tell me how it went, I'd be delighted to hear. So I'll try to include my email address, lots of questions. Thanks.
the, there are reactions. Right. Right. There's always right. There's always a reason. They always look retrospectively, and you know, sports commentators and then well, that's a whole good lunch conversation. You know, sort of, you know they'll say, Mark Albert, uh, you know, inching his way back there, he's a career man now. He's driving me nuts for years. But Michael Jordan is two for his last three. It's, you know, something like that. <laughs> you know, he's got. You know, uh, since Scotty Pippen got in the game, came back in the game, Michael's made two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you know, it, 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 it is a hard concept. The trend, you know, yesterday Mark was here and now it's here. Now it's here right now. Two point, now it's a two point linear decision. Rush out, why does he rush out himself? Because it went down. Right, right, right. 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 And, uh, anyway, it, uh, I'm still in my house in Vermont right now. And yesterday I was thinking, good thing I got it in before the mortgage rate went over the last time. Oh, my buyer doesn't get cold feet because he has to pay even an eight or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Comment, we do blame the weather forecast as not allow any rain. We aren't all much rain in this there either, right? And they're not allowed. Huh? They sneak in that chance of rain, but they yes. never really want to talk about I don't think it just doesn't get probably statements anymore. He's in probably statements of probably. Well they give them, they give them, but they don't really discuss. You know, it'd be interesting actually to ask. I'm sure people have done this. Ask 20 people, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the restrooms are, we've got the door to the, uh, the right, both men and women. Uh, the FDR, Huckley Dining Room, we've got the door, you need left, just follow the hallway, all the way to get to the bookstore. At the bookstore, make a right, and at the end of that hall, we make another right, and the first door on your right. So it's, they're all right, so you can't go wrong. <laughs> Yeah. 
idea here, the, the, the idea behind this talk and what I've been trying to do in the last couple of years is that my perception has been that students, uh, especially this past year at Cornell, when they started teaching engineers for the, for the first time, have very little practice considering random processes. You know, that, that uh, they don't really think about the idea that uh, we spend our whole life looking at problems and are rewarded for saying what comes next in this sequence. Very deterministic puzzles. If you pick up a copy of Games Magazine, which uh, my son got a subscription to for a while, there's a tremendous number of puzzles with what comes next, what comes next. All very deterministic. And the kids, especially kids who are good at math, are often really rewarded for very deterministic get these things in a sequence pick, uh, picking. It'd be hard to have a, a crossword puzzle or, or develop <laughs> puzzles where the answers were random. <laughs> but uh, real world data has a lot of randomness in it and we don't sort of encourage people. You know, the kids who are really good at math and science in, in particular have been rewarded for not thinking randomly, but always for imposing that, for, well, for recognizing patterns. Then it's my perception that what happens is that later on when faced with random data, they impose patterns, even when there isn't one, because they've always been, you know, they've always been looking for what's a pattern, what's a pattern. So what I like to do is try to, throughout the semester, think about what things in the world might be random, okay, and, well, and recognizing what's random uh, and what's deterministic, what's not random. So one thing that we do get a lot of, of, there are a lot of good reasons to teach math courses and statistics courses with different points of view, for different disciplines. But they do have a lot in common, especially if they're trying to model the real world, uh, model things in the real world. So while this notation may not be exactly appropriate for, for students in the high school AP class, well, even for, for some of the good ones, it would be. When I tell the engineers that they're doing, the engineers I teach at Cornell usually have at least three semesters of calculus. And I say, here's what you've been doing, and here's what we're going to do this semester. And recognizing when there's randomness and when there's random error it is really an important part of uh, what you do. So what I was thinking about was looking for ways to just try and get fun ways to train the students to think about randomness. So the point of this session and, and my talk is just to try and come up with a few ways where on short notice you can sneak in some ideas uh, about the random, random phenomenon. And There's sort of two components to that. We try to think about, try to do something that emphasizes recognizing randomness, uh, real world problems where there's, uh, and, and deciding whether or not they have a random component. Another one when we do, we think about producing randomness, that in fact so much of what we do re relies on random sampling. And many of the applications we see involve making sure there are equal chances, you know, fair chances and gains and sampling and polling. People need to be, people are going to use statistics in both recognizing and to produce, uh, generate some things that are random. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. But anyway, it's a nice interaction between uh, math, nature, and philosophy. One, th one thing I think gets undervalued in statistics and, and can happen especially if you look at and you emphasize real data, that, that's great, we should do that of course. But one of the things it can do is kind of, I, I think really the deciding the randomness is really a neat big picture issue, you know? What is, is randomness just what we don't know yet? Maybe if we understood the world better, it wouldn't appear, you know, things wouldn't appear random. And it gives a, a good chance to talk to students a little bit. And the engineers, when, when I used to teach this material for liberal arts students at St. Michael's, what I used to think was, well, these kids already have to take a lot of philosophy courses, and this is my chance to teach them something technical. Not with the engineers, I think. They're already taking a lot of technical courses. This is my chance to try and look at a couple of big picture issues. And so I, I think it's, it's you know, fun to spend a little time at least thinking about what it means, you know, not just analyzing data, but what, you know, what does data mean? I, I don't want to make a, well, I'd love to make a whole course out of it with the right, a little bunch of students. I, I don't want to make my whole course that way, but I do want to give students a flavor that there are big, you know, some bigger issues to talk about here. Uh, what I'm really after, uh, I guess the most frustrating teaching evaluations I get, and I get a lot of them, are ones that say, Professor Gore is an interesting professor and sure made this dull material worthwhile, or, you know, dull material less interesting than I thought. And I always go, geez, what a failure. 
Because I don't think it's dull material at all. You know, if I if I haven't convinced them that it's not a dull subject, I really feel like I let them down. So uh, kind of these are a few things. Things are in the handout, and then we'll we'll try now. Or a few of my responses to try and get them to think that the material is interesting and the big picture questions are interesting, not just the material. So since we're on the duty to teach from last year, I think I'll start with my real favorite first day activity for this, which I I call number two. But this is a, a poultry activity, and it occurs to me that uh, I didn't erase the scores from yesterday, probably. Head on. So the first thing we're going to do is spend a minute uh, taking our pulse. So if everybody could find the find if you have a pulse after all these dots, uh, find your pulse, and I'll, I'll, I'll count for the drug. I'll give you 30 seconds, and then you can count your pulse, and we'll double it to get your pulse in just a minute. And you can start counting. Now. Okay. What are the factors that affect pulses? 
Why are some people different than another? Ages. Ages. Yeah, uh, business is a short word. Time of day. Time of day, good. these 